Each day, more than 2,100 patients turn to Catholic Health Services Catholic Home Care Team to provide them with the necessary services and support to assist in the recovery from a recent illness or surgery. The team of more than 650 dedicated professionals, paraprofessionals, and support staff ensure that your home care needs are being met 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Today, we'll discuss a new program being offered by Catholic Home Care that can assist you or your loved one with medication management on today's episode of CHS Presents Lifestyles at the Heart of Health. Hello, everyone, and thanks so much for joining us. I'm Jane Hansen. Catholic Home Care's extensive team of dedicated professionals, paraprofessionals, and support staff provides patients with a variety of services geared not to simply maintain, but to dramatically improve the quality of life and independence. Joining me today is Mary Frawley, Director of Patient Services for Catholic Home Care. Thanks so much for being with us. Hi, Jane. So let's do this definition of exactly what is home care versus outpatient versus in-hospital. I know there's some very specific definitions. Sure. Thanks, Jane. The patients that we care for in the home, many of them are recently discharged from the hospital. Maybe they may have had open heart surgery. They may have had congestive heart failure in the hospital. And they need a nurse to assess and to teach them about their medications, about their disease process. They may have a wound that needs to be cared for. Or the patient might be debilitated and need physical therapy, occupational therapy, or speech therapy. In addition to that, some of our patients require a social worker to help them uh, navigate the world of health care and the entitlements that they have to help them stay independent in their home. And other patients also need the aid of a home health aide to help them get dressed and bathe each day. So you're really talking about kind of a vast variety from somebody who might just need a little bit of care and some navigational help to somebody who really needs to help just getting up. Yes. And so along, how many people then, you've got this giant staff of 650 plus people, so does that encompass kind of all those different areas? It does. I would say about 450 to 500 of the employees are all staff that are out working in the field seeing patients in their home each day. And what are their kinds of services that are, might be unique to your particular home care service? One of the services that we provide is called telehealth, and that's where we're able to monitor patients' blood pressure, their heart rate, their oxygen level in the home each day so that we can get accurate readings and see if they have changed at all in their weight. Maybe someone who has congestive heart failure and they're gaining weight so that we can act on it more quickly rather than when they see the physician or at the next nursing visit. Uh, some of the other services that we provide, we have a behavioral health team that assists patients with any kind of uh, mental health illness such as depression, anxiety. Uh, sometimes just coping with having surgery can be uh, very devastating to a patient. So we have behavioral health nurses, we have an infusion team, all of those specialty areas, uh, pediatric team. What's infusion mean? Might be patients that require IV therapy. Uh, maybe you might have an infection and you require uh, IV antibiotics for about six weeks. So some of those patients will come home and receive that therapy in their home. You talked about, what, did you call it telecare? Tele telehealth. Telehealth. Now, is that, done, is that done in person or is that something that can be done electronically? It's electronic. So we uh, deliver the equipment to their home and then each day they put the blood pressure cuff on. They monitor their blood pressure remotely. It transmits to our nursing team that are in the office. And then if there's any um, numbers that are abnormal, they'll contact the patient and the physician and let them know. Boy, that's really very handy in helping you keep good track of these people. It's really helping to keep patients out of the hospital. It has reduced uh, the rehospitalization rate for our congestive heart patients enormously. So we're very grateful that we have modern technology today. You talked about managing medication. I'm assuming that that's a really tough nut to crack sometimes. It sure is. There's so many factors 
that impede the patient being able to be compliant with their medications. Some of the factors that the patients might have is lack of knowledge about how to take their medication or maybe they don't have the funds to purchase their medication. Some of our patients have to make a choice each week whether they buy groceries for their family or they buy their medications. You mean it's not covered? Sometimes some patients don't have insurance or sometimes the copay that goes along with it is so high that it's very difficult for the patient to make that decision to, between buying their meds and buying their groceries. Well, that's horrible. I mean, that's because they need the meds to keep themselves alive, but or at least healthy. Sure. Um, so talk about this program then. You have a specific name for the medication management program. Yes, we do. It's called REACT. We had a group of clinicians that came together to help develop this program because we really see medication adherence and compliance as one of the biggest factors that will help keep patients out of the hospital. So together we came up with the program, REACT. It stands for uh, Reconcile, Engage, Assess, Coach, and Teach Back. So each step of the process really helps get the patient involved in understanding their medications, assuring they're taking accurate medications, and that they understand what we taught them on the visit. Uh, we begin by reconciling the medications. We take all of their medications, anything they put on or in their body that is in food. So vitamins, um, maybe they have some kind of steroids or something like that, creams? Everything, eye drops. Eye and drops. Of, and of course, their prescription medications. We want to know every kind of medication that's going into or on the body to make sure that we have an accurate list so there's no interactions with any of the medications. Because that's a big problem, right? Absolutely. Sometimes patients are taking two of the same medication and don't even realize it. So, and then when you have, so somebody comes home from surgery perhaps, and now they've got a new kind of medication and, it's, and, and they still have the old. I mean, I, this sounds like a nightmare sometimes. We walk into the homes many times and the patient has been admitted to the hospital for shortness of breath and the doctor adjusted their medications to help them improve. They come home feeling better and they go back to their old medication regime, not understanding that all of their medications have been changed. They may have increased a dose, added a new medication, and when we come in, sometimes the patients don't understand that the medications have changed. So it's key in getting the patient to understand the new regime to help keep them healthy. So you literally will take a table like this and have it full of all kinds of bottles and pills and everything else, right? Many of our med patients will be on 20, 25, 30 medications at a time. And it really takes a lot of time to go through them, but in the end we see the results are very much worth it because the patient is safer and healthier for that. And do you find frequently that there are bottles of old medications just kind of laying around that people might yeah, say they get a sniffle and they want an antibiotic or something? or a Absolutely. More than that, you know, medications are expensive. So if the doctor discontinues the medication that they just spent $100 on, they don't want to throw it in the garbage. So it'll stay in the closet just in case he orders that next time they go back. And it can cause some confusion as to what medications the patient actually should be taking. Not to mention it might have expired. Exactly. We come across many expired medications and even then sometimes the patients do not want to throw them out or get rid of them. And we're a guest in the patient's home so we have to try and educate the patient but also respect their wishes because it is their home. And do you think sometimes that people will take a lot of things like certain kind of vitamins because they see a news story that says, oh, we all need more vitamin D and then they see something else about vitamin B or, and, and so those, we may take way too much of that? Absolutely, there's some vitamins that interact with some of your medications. Coumadin is a blood thinner. Vitamin K is one of the vitamins that interacts with Coumadin when you take too much of it. So if you were taking that in addition to the Coumadin, it would really make that medication ineffective. Counter-effective. Yes. Oh boy, that, so that's a real education in and of itself for these patients. Do you, what, do you set them up with a whole little like list of what they should take when and set up all the pills and all of that? Part of our reconciliation process is to, to, excuse me, is to develop the one source of truth. And so we make a complete list of every medication the patient is taking. Uh, part of the process is to engage the patient in that. We ask them to help write the list. And then we ask them to keep the list current. So if they see the doctor in between nursing visits, they can add the medication to the list 
and when the nurse makes the next visit, they'll go over the medication with them. We ask them to bring that list to each doctor that they go to so every physician knows all the medications and vitamins and over-the-counter meds that they're taking. Wow, that's quite some job. Okay, well, we're going to continue talking to you in a little bit, but first, we're going to take a quick break, and we'll be right back after this. Welcome back to CHS Presents Lifestyles at the Heart of Health. I'm joined now by Igor Nimov, the Director of Performance Improvement and Clinical Education for Catholic Home Care. Welcome, glad to have you here. Thank you, Jane. So you, on average, are dealing with about 2,300 patients That's across correct. the system. That's a lot of people to manage. That's correct, yeah. How do you do that on a daily basis? With a very dedicated staff, field staff and office staff that actually take care of the patient and does their passion. We just talked about with Mary one source of truth. Where'd that name come from? Um, we were researching what would be the best catchy name for the patients to actually get more engaged into the, um, you know, managing their own medications. Mm -hmm. You know, being a little bit more of a self-advocating for uh, medication management and staying healthy and staying out of the hospitals. So we came up with this name as a very catchy name and for a religious affiliated organization. It's something that speaks to us and speaks to our mission. Yeah, absolutely, because your mission at the end of the day is to get the patient to be able to take care of themselves. That's correct. That's absolutely right. Uh huh. So the goal is their own kind of medical management. That's, that's, that's the key component of the REACT process in general because we're trying to put the patient in a driving seat. So that's, that's what the change in the structure of the whole medication management is. Mm -hmm. we, uh, almost always as a, a healthcare professionals impose upon the patient what we need the patients to do. But the reality of the situation is that the patients might have different issues or different factors that, or different obstacles that impact their ability to manage their own medications. And we took that in consideration and we're trying to actually get the patients to be more engaged, more proactive in their medication management. So uh, Mary was telling us anecdotally about some of the things that she'd seen with patients and expired medicines and vitamins interacting. I know you've kind of experienced that same thing. Can you tell me what maybe one of the worst scenarios is? Well, um, the, one of the worst scenarios, of course, comes with the anticoagulants or, or, or blood thin or medications such as Coumadin, where the patient might have a prescription from a cardiologist from uh, six months ago to take uh, three milligrams of Coumadin. Uh, and that's a very um, dangerous medication in a way that needs to be monitored periodically uh, through the uh, blood, uh, blood tests. Um, un unfortunately, a lot of times that, that dosage is being changed by a different doctor. Subsequently, the patients that are confused about the medications and all different medication regimens are taking either double dose of medications, triple dose of medications, sometimes <laughs> putting themselves at risk for not only just the hospitalization, but very serious side effects associated with the bleeding. Mm -hmm. So that's a that's, that's very scary experience for the patients or the loved ones. Um, that's what you're trying to prevent uh, in managing um, the medications for the patients. I think most people don't even recognize, though, though, that vitamins or eye drops or maybe nose sprays or even some kinds of cream yeah. can actually all interact. Yeah, it's, it's funny you mention it because uh, there is a specific uh, uh, medication, um, such as garlic, for example, which is very popular on the market right now, taking over, boosting your immune system, that actually interacts with Coumadin as a blood thinner. And, uh, predisposes the patient for increased bleeding risk. So taking that garlic pill, is that what you're saying? That's well, correct. Oh my, whoa, that that's is a correct. little... I'll... And not a lot of people are aware of it. So that's one of the things that uh, we're trying to work with the patients on. We're trying to explain to the patients what the side effects are from... Um, and also part of it is also to talk to the physicians about what the patients are taking in their home, because a lot of physicians are not aware of it either. The patients are taking the medications that were not prescribed by a physician, because that's just a supplement for them. Well, and sometimes, isn't it true that some people will have, they'll have surgery with one doctor, but they might have a different doctor that manages a different part of that same illness. 
and it can be hard to coordinate that. That's correct. That's part of, uh, of uh, issue in the health, uh, health system in general, that the care is very fragmented and you have a lot of physicians in charge of the patients. It could be cardiologist, pulmonologist, um, a surgeon, and so on and so forth. People with multiple uh, comorbidities or multiple conditions might have several physicians and the coordination is very important. And it's hard for a patient to do that. That's, that's absolutely right, especially when they're sick. Mm -hmm. And yeah, because you, when you're sick, all you want to do is get better. You That's know, really, correct. It's, you're in a blur, so to speak. So how do you do that then? Do you actually call the, the doctors? Do you coordinate all of that? That's, that's correct. We are coordinating with the physicians. We are just trying to make sure that the medications are reconciled. So medication reconciliation process is to make physician aware of all the medications that the patients are taking, including the ones that were prescribed by a different physician or were not prescribed at all, such as vitamins, herbal supplements, whatever that might be, or lotions. So again, if you're, you, when you get this one page, this, this truth, page of one truth, source of one truth. source of truth, That's right. when you get that, is that then electronic? Can that be distributed to all of the doctors involved in a patient's care? Well, the form itself is for the patient's use. And that's very important because that form lists all the medications that the patients are taking, including the medications that were not prescribed by a doctor. Mm -hmm. And we encourage the patient to take those forms to the doctor's appointment. So doctor would be aware of all of the medications that the patients are taking. That's part of the catching process. So we're just trying to assure that the doctor is aware of all the medications. This would seem to be a prime place where real technology could help to keep all those records and be able to send them to. And we're working on that as well. Um, that, that's, that's our plan for the future. Oh, that's fantastic. Now, the typical patient is how long in home care? Uh, anywhere between 23 and 25 days. So that's, that's an average. Mm -hmm. And so once they're done with you guys, then what happens to them? Well, that's, that's what were our concerns um, about the pa patient's um, um, you know, status after they actually discharge from our services. We want to make sure that they stay healthy. We want to make sure that they stay uh, out of the hospital because majority of the patients do not want to come back to the hospital. They don't want to be hospitalized. <laughs> Sorry, they don't I understand. Want to get sick. <laughs> right. So um, we are trying to assure that the patients managing their own, their own health record and their own medications. So we're empowering the patients through the One Source of Truth, through the REACT process at, at, at all, to actually uh, advocate for their own health, to advocate for their own medications. We coach them, and that's part of the REACT process, how to talk to their physicians, how to actually discuss the medications and the side effects that they actually encounter. Because that's, that could be a major block or major obstacle for the patients sure. when they're taking the medications. It only makes sense. Now, you are actually the Director of Performance Improvement. So does that mean that you're responsible for charting success? That's correct. That's absolutely right. And we're enjoying a great success with this program so far. Not only in terms of um, decreasing the rehospitalization rate for the patients, but also in terms of the patient satisfaction. Because now the patients understand that the providers talk to them and communicate with them on the same level without you know, putting a guilt on them or shaming them for something that they've done, such mm -hmm. as taking a herbal supplement or vitamin. Sure, because that's, people don't normally take things because they're, they think they're good for them. That's correct. But I, I certainly, I mean, I certainly take plenty of vitamins and I have never thought about the idea that some things might not work in unison with the others. That's absolutely right. So you right. take that to a much greater place. Absolutely. With somebody that's really ill. That's absolutely right. Yes, I, and, and that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to keep our patients safer by explaining to them what the side effects are, what the inter drug interactions are. And we also encourage them to actually look up their medications as well. For those who are able to do it, this day and age when everything is available electronically, they're able to do it on their own. But we are absolutely providing the information for them to make sure that they're safe. Don't you get afraid when people look up too much no. <laughs> on the internet? No. The patients that actually uh, know about their, their health are more engaged in their health. And that's, that's the key component. We want the patients to be engaged. We want them to be healthier. Mm -hmm. We, we don't want them to come back to the, to the hospitals. We want them to stay out. Yeah, because That's you, our role. Got it. All right, we'll stay right here because we're going to continue talking. We're going to take another break, and we'll be right back with more. CHS presents Lifestyles at the Heart of Health right after this.
Welcome back to CHS Presents Lifestyles at the Heart of Health. As we continue our conversation about quality Catholic home care and the success of Catholic Health Services REACT program, I'm joined once again by our two guests, Mary Frawley and Igor Nimov. Welcome back again to both of you. Thank, Thank you. Too. Um, so the one thing that we really haven't talked about is this idea of helping patients navigate a lot. And that really means you literally call up the doctors and coordinate? Absolutely. Our first visit in the home with the patient, we go through all of their medications, we assess the patient, and then we'll call the physician to let him know what's going on with the patient, what services are provided, and any medications that we have a question about, we'll reconcile with the physician on the phone. Because quite often, it's very rare that we, our list matches everything that the patient <laughs> is taking in the home. I'll bet that's true. So when you call the doctor up then, I mean, sometimes you calling him on a Saturday or uh, off hours, that sort of thing, trying to coordinate all this stuff? That's correct. We call in the doctors seven days a week, 24 hours a day sometimes. Uh-huh. And the importance of being able to do this is sometimes patients just simply can't do it themselves. Not only that the patients cannot do, them, uh, do it themselves, but we need to coach the patients on how to do it properly. So if you're doing it sometimes in front of the patients, to explain to the patients what we need them to do while well, we're not there in the pictures anymore. So mm -hmm. uh, that's one of the things that we're trying to do. We're trying to engage the patient more and more in advocating for their own health. So who is actually eligible for home care, Catholic home care? Many of the patients that we take care for are recently discharged from the hospital. They've had surgery, they've had some procedure, or they've had an exacerbation of their illness. Uh, most insurances cover home care services. And uh, really, anyone that's coming out of the hospital that ha has a difficult time getting out of the home is eligible for home care. So even if you've got a full component of family or somebody, a support system at home, still uh, Catholic home care is, is a way to go for people as well? They're still sure. eligible? Sure. Sometimes the family is the care team, so they may need education about the medications or how to transfer the patient safely from the bed to the chair. Uh, so certainly it doesn't matter that there's family in the home. We're, we're happy to see the family there because we'll teach the family as well. So insurance always covers it? For the most part, insurances do cover the services. Mm -hmm. but, um, but isn't there a qualification that they have to be homebound or something like that? Most insurances require that uh, the patient is homebound, which really means it takes a difficult and taxing effort to get out of the home. Because they feel, the insurance companies feel, if you're easily able to get out of the home, you probably could go to the physician for the care. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, so we've got this fabulous home care um, system. What happens once you guys are out of the picture? <laughs> well, sometimes we'll connect the patient with outpatient services. Other times, uh, they'll be in the care of their primary care physician. Hopefully, we've made them independent enough during the time that we were in there that they know the right questions to ask the doctor and to follow up with the physician on, on a regular basis. And you've told me that you had speech therapists, occupational therapists, you have social workers. I mean, what, how do you determine how much of the team you're going to need on a regular basis? Well, the doctor's ordering the services, but we also assess the patient for the needs. Every patient is individually uh, assessed for what the services that the, this particular patient needs, including the social work services, physical therapy, occupational therapy services, whatever the patient's condition uh, uh, is, so we can actually assess the patient properly and treat the patient properly. So for the people that are watching um, this program, I'm just wondering, what, I mean, there have got to be people that don't avail themselves of this service and they should. So how do you find out about it if you don't know? I would say um, if they call our intake desk and they had any questions if they were eligible for home care, certainly could call seven days a week. There's someone there that can answer their questions. Our number is really 24 hours. There's always a nurse on call that can answer any questions as well. And how about children? Are children also eligible under this? Yes. We do have pediatric team. Yes. Uh -huh. and, but the kids are not in charge of their own medicine, I'm sure. That's correct. <laughs> You've got a parent or some adult that has to, has to take care of that. What do you think, um, I, don't, I don't know how long these services have been around. I know you've been with it for at least 15 years or something yes, like that. Yes, I have. So have you seen the service change in its scope? I know this REACT program is relatively new. Well, what we're seeing now is patients are coming home from the hospital sicker than they were when That's I started 15 years ago. 
They're spending shorter time in the hospital. We're looking uh, next year at seeing some orthopedic patients come home same day they have surgery after a total knee replacement. So we're seeing a patient who might be in more pain than they were before, uh, definitely uh, have more difficulty ambulating and getting around the house than they were before. So we're definitely seeing a patient that looks much different than they did 15 years ago. But I'm curious, I mean, there's been a big push to do a lot of ambulatory surgery and, and there have been many changes in the technology and the, and the methods and the way to do it. So physicians feel it's safe to send them home. Um, but from your viewpoint, is that true? It might be safe to, save, uh, to send the patients home. However, we assess for the environment in the patient's home, which physicians and surgeons are often not aware of. So that's sure. part of what we're actually doing. We're trying to make sure that the patient is safe at home after those ambulatory surgeries, such as the presence of the steps or porch or whatever that might be that impacts the patient's ambulation is important in terms of assessing the patient's environment. So does that mean if somebody has ambulatory surgery and they're able to go home the next day or the day after, I mean that day even, do you physically have a team that goes out right then? We, we go in the next day. As soon as you're discharged from the hospital, within 24 hours, our nurse is there to make a visit um, the, the very next morning. Mm -hmm. And is it, does it ever happen that a patient has to go back in? Unfortunately, yes. Mm -hmm. And that's just because they, they don't have the, enough care at home or can't? They don't have enough care at home or it could be the environment is not conducive for them to stay safely at home. Uh, they don't have presence of a caregiver that's going to be able to help them 24-7. A lot of other issues uh, could be a psychosocial factor involved as well in the patients. What can you tell me about what patients say when they're, when you guys have helped them with this very, helping this very complex situation of the medication and getting them on track? Um, so we're receiving a lot of commendations letter from the patients talking about how the communications have improved between the patients and the providers. Um, because we're hearing the patients better. We communicate with the patients. We're not shaming the patients for whatever they're doing at home because, again, we are really guests in their home. Uh, we are just trying to get the patients better and preventing them from going to the hospital again. And Mary, how about you? What do you hear from them? I, I had a great experience even when I was in the field. I went to see a patient one morning who had a problem with uh, a catheter. And he said to me when I arrived, he had been in a lot of pain and he knew that I would change the catheter. And then when I walked in the door, he said to me, oh my gosh, this is what an angel looks like. Aww. And it really makes you feel um, like you're doing something rewarding and you're really helping someone to get to their home and they know that they're going to feel better when you leave. Um, it's a, definitely a very fulfilling job. Well, you look like an angel. <laughs> oh, thanks. Thank you both so much for being with us. And thank you uh, for watching. For more information or to schedule an appointment at one of Catholic Health Service's six outstanding hospitals, or for information about this and all programs offered by CHS, you can call 1-855-CHS-4500 or visit chsli.org. Thanks so much for joining us today. I'm Jane Hansen wishing you goodbye and good health. Thank you.